Good evening, everybody. My name is Susan Hay, and I am the current president of Environment Halberton, the organizer of tonight's event. I'm sure that you will really enjoy tonight's presentation by Terry Sprague from Prince Edward County. And I'll be introducing Terry in a couple of minutes, but first I would like to ask Carolyn Coburn from Environment Halberton to give our land acknowledgement. Good evening. Yes, my name's Carolyn Coburn. Environment Halliburton is an organization that is based on the lands and waters that are the traditional homeland of the Ojibwe, the Huron-Wendat, the Mohawk, and the Algonquins of Golden Lake. We acknowledge their stewardship throughout the ages and our responsibility to be good stewards of this land. We also need to press the Canadian government to uphold the treaties that have been made with Indigenous peoples. I've been thinking about the phrase land acknowledgement. Tonight, I invite you to join me in acknowledging the land. The land gives us food. The land gives us material to make shelters to protect us from the cold and material to heat those shelters. The land provides minerals with which we manufacture many items that give us the material quality of life we are used to. I acknowledge all those aspects of the land on which our lives depend. We speak these acknowledgments in recognition that to be in right relations with all, we must strive to repair our relationship with Indigenous peoples and with the land. Thanks, Carolyn. Terry Sprague, our presenter for tonight, has been intrigued, intrigued by nature ever since he was a little kid. And over a period of 50 years, he has written 2,600 columns about it for the Picton Gazette in Prince Edward County. He's had a fascinating career, much of which dealt with nature and teaching others about it. He has been the recipient of a number of awards for his enthusiastic efforts to promote conservation and environmental protection. I'm really looking forward to his talk. After Terry's presentation, there will be some time for questions. And by now, most of you are familiar with the chat box, so please type any questions you may have into it. And now I'm going to ask Terry to share his screen and I will hand the meeting over to you now, Terry. Thank you very much. Um, just let me share my screen. I'm one person who cannot do two things at one time. I barely do one thing. Uh, All right, here we go. So good evening, everyone. And it's so good to be back in Halliburton, if only through virtual means. Um, I'm sure all of you recognize this uh, location at the end of Skyline Park Road. It's certainly one of my favorite destinations whenever I visit or pass through Halliburton. And it's been a few years since I've, I've been there, so I'm looking forward to returning. And I think this photo exemplifies the message in this evening's talk. Um, in Halliburton area, you have some magnificent scenery and natural habitat, and it's essential, essential that you protect these natural features and the water courses upon which they touch. Uh, my late wife actually was from Coe Hill, which is only about, I don't know, 50 or 60 kilometers, I guess, from Halliburton as the crow flies. This evening's presentation has actually been adapted from a, a six week backyard naturalization course that I used to teach at Quinney Conservation about 10 or, 10 or 12 years ago, I guess where I used to work. And it became so popular that I never failed to have a full complement of registrations. I think it was around 24, maybe 26, where all we had room to accommodate. And what started out as a very simple course providing details on native shrubs one could plant in their backyard, um, soon evolved into something much greater. There was this tremendous interest in expanding a uh, six week course to include how to attract wildlife to the backyard. And that sort of tied into the plant species I had recommended that produced the seeds and fruit that would work towards providing food for backyard visitors. And from there, the course took on some new twists and turns over its 20 year 
uh, lifespan and morphed into a sort of a backyard responsibility theme. How do you utilize everything that you produce in your backyard so that nothing or very little goes to the curbside as waste? And I think that's, that's very important. So here then are the results of that effort condensed down uh, from six weeks to hopefully only 45 minutes or so. We'll see how fast I can talk if I can talk like an auctioneer tonight. Uh, so we're going to touch on all those things this evening. So I call this backyard wildlife uh, what to expect and how to attract. Now, if you look very carefully into that raccoon's eyes, you'll see uh, two spots of red. That is actually, believe it or not, the jacket that the photographer was wearing. Peter Sporing is his name from Belleville uh, when he took this picture. And then, you know, when we attract wildlife by planting native shrubs and trees, uh, you get to a point where, well, maybe you have a little bit too much of a good thing. Uh, so I'm touching also on how to dissuade uh, some of those animals that you have been successful attracting. So why do we want to attract wildlife anyway? Well, it completes the picture. It's like having a fish aquarium. You can have the gravel, you can have the plants, you can have the, the ornaments and the water gurgling away, but it's not really complete until you get the, the, the fish in there, that live element. And the same thing applies to your backyard. It's, you can do all the plantings, you know, that we recommend, but it's not really complete until you start to attract wildlife. So here we have a uh, white-breasted nuthatch doing a, a flyby at a feeder that is already occupied by a chipmunk. So it's, it's the entertainment value. Okay, you do have to be cautious though when encouraging wildlife to the backyard. Let's take John and Mary, for example. Now, John and Mary have just moved, uh, we'll say to Halliburton. And John looks out the window one morning and he sees a deer and he hollers to Mary, come here and have a look at what's out in our backyard. We have a deer. I wonder what I have to do in order to, um, you know, have this deer stay. So it's suggested that he visit the Halliburton Feed and Seed Company and talk to someone there. And that person suggests that, um, well, get uh, some deer pellets. So it's a feed that you can feed deer. Maybe it'll stay around, put it in a little pile and see what happens. So John does that. And then the next morning he looks out and he's got two deer. And he uh, goes back to the feed company and he asks, well, you know, I've got two deer now and I'd like to keep them around. He says, well, you could possibly get a few more. Uh, by putting more feed in little piles around the yard where you want to attract them. So he does that and he looks out the window the next day and this is what he sees. Uh, and now this is a bit of an exaggeration, of course, but these deer were uh, deliberately attracted here, uh, encouraged to, to come. And I'm not saying that you'll have this kind of a situation, but it does point out the fact that uh, eventually, if you don't do it the right way and watch what you're doing, you may have an overabundance of uh, what you had tried to attract in the first place. So just a quick lesson in habitat. Uh, we want to attract wildlife, but how do we go about doing that? This, by the way, is my late wife feeding a chipmunk. You probably have heard of John and Janet Foster, the uh, well-known um, nature photographers and filmmakers. Well, we were at their place for a barbecue one day and uh, these chipmunks, there were about five or six kept coming along and my wife just loved wildlife. She just, she really enjoyed the chipmunks. She enjoyed just having wildlife around her. Um, it's important to realize that habitat must meet four basic needs. And those four basic needs are number one, food. Here we have a red-eyed vireo that's got some kind of a long-legged critter in its, in its lead. Um, the other requirement, which is something you have already probably guessed, is water. And water can be in the form of a bird bath uh, or maybe a, or a little fish pond out back, or maybe you're very fortunate enough to have a little creek or stream that flows through your property. The water will certainly attract uh, wildlife. The third requirement is shelter. And what I mean by shelter is the, um, 
the places where the wildlife that occupy your area is going to uh, raise their young. That can be literally in a tree, in a, in a cavity uh, of a tree, or in the branches of a tree, depending on what the species is, uh, or if it's a forest floor de um, dwelling animal uh, using the habitat that's on the, on the ground. So uh, you need the shelter. The shelter has to be there. That requirement has to be present. And the fourth is space. And what I mean by space is that with few exceptions, uh, all species of wildlife uh, require a certain uh, amount of real estate. And that can vary according to the species. And most species are territorial, so they're not going to let anything else in. Now, if you've got a backyard of say, maybe an acre or two, you may notice that uh, you only have X number of robins, for instance, nesting. Uh, on your property and you'll never get any more than that because robins are territorial. They're not going to let any other robins nest in what they call their, their private area. So whatever number you have, that's what you're going to, to continue to have. Um, other species require far less, of course, depending on the species. Um, others require more. For instance, uh, pileated woodpeckers are said to require at least 150 acres of, um, uh, of wooded area. And that's pretty tough down our way. It might be a little bit easier to accomplish in, in the north in, in your area. Um, but I think their requirements are starting to um, drop a little bit because I'm seeing more and more cases of pileated woodpeckers coming to backyard bird feeders. They're coming into backyards, which is something they never used to do. So food, water, shelter, space. Those are the four requirements when you're planning to back, uh, do backyard naturalization with the hope of attracting wildlife. And with that in mind, you can manage wildlife that you have on your property by managing that habitat. So let me give you an example. Uh, say for instance, you've got starlings coming to your bird feeder. They're coming to a hunk of suet that you put out. Not everyone cares for starlings because they're very messy, they're very quarrelsome, and they tend to overtake a feeder. You watch their habits and you realize that, well, starlings aren't very adept to hanging upside down. So you put your suet in an upside down um, suet feeder. That's not saying that you're going to have complete success, but it will certainly control the numbers that you have coming. So that's one very simple way of managing the habitat. You manage the food uh, and, and that'll, that'll go a long way. So food, water, shelter, and space, we call this biodiversity. It used to be called the web of life. Uh, and it's based on the uh, very simple premise that all wildlife has worth, even the lonely skunk. They're all here for a reason. They're all intermingling together. Uh, they're all doing their thing and forming part of biodiversity. Uh, many species are declining. Here we have a Vesper sparrow. Vesper sparrows on our farm were very common because we did a lot of haying, uh, we had a lot of open fields and vesper sparrows love that kind of habitat. They nest in the hay fields and but they use the fence bottoms to, uh, to sing from, to uh, claim their territory or proclaim their territory. Um, vesper sparrows are no longer there in any kind of abundance at all, if they're there at all, period, because the farm has been allowed to grow up to nature and it's attracting new wildlife species now. So what's been happening? Uh, this is a, a, an aerial shot that I took, oh, maybe 10 years ago uh, near a little community called Wapoos. And I dare say, I don't think it has changed that much because of the type of crops and, and uh, so forth that they grow down there. This is what we like to see. We like to see all these natural treed corridors so that wildlife can go from one breeding area to another and have healthier populations. More and more in Prince Edward County, and it's almost epidemic, uh, we are seeing, for instance, if this was someplace else in the county, we are seeing all these fields, all these corridors being bulldozed into oblivion and all these fields being made into one giant field 
Now, I'm not saying that's wrong necessarily. I sympathize with farmers because time is money. I was a farmer myself, but we live back in a different time. And they're operating with uh, bigger machinery now, so they have to do this. But still in all, it's very sad to see all these important uh, wildlife hedgerows and, and fence bottoms and so forth just being destroyed. How times have changed. Remember how we used to manage our properties? My father, my late father, uh, bless his heart, his idea of managing a woodlot was to cut down all the dead and dying trees. It was common practice back then uh, and, and literally clean it up, you know, clean all the brush out and everything like that. And then you would put it in a great big pile. And one day when that pile had dried, you would go back uh, uh, to the field or to the woods uh, with maybe a, a bale or two of straw in the back, maybe a gallon of old oil, uh, and a rubber tire or two, and you set that thing ablaze. And that, that was good, that was good back in those days. But times have changed. Uh, we're beginning to realize now that messy is good. Uh, this rotting log, for instance, doesn't look to have any life around it at all. Uh, back in the earlier days, this log would have been hauled out of there and burned up in the brush pile, or if it was good enough, it would be sawed up for firewood. But it provides damp shelter and food for many plants and animals. It's like a little micro ecosystem, so to speak. And these animals and plants are the recyclers. They're helping to put the nutrients back into the soil for other forest plants to use as they grow. And it's habitat to a variety of insects, including carpenter ants, bugs, centipedes, beetles, crickets, you name it. Um, there are fungi there and they're all working together. Um, to break that log down into usable components for uh, plants, wildflowers, and trees that come up beside it. So it's, it's an ongoing um, biological situation happening there. And you might even find the woolly bear. Uh, they're always fun to watch, and um, they eventually develop into the Isabella tiger moth. And brush piles are habitat. Um, uh, I have, I, I'm just trying to count them up. I think I have four brush piles on my two acres. Uh, they're small brush piles, but wildlife really, really enjoy having these natural uh, brush piles and they, they decompose quickly enough. You don't have to worry about them always being there. Um, and I, I get a lot of uh, enjoyment out of watching birds in the winter time using these brush piles to uh, I don't know what they're doing. They're darting in and out all the time and probably getting food of some sort. Today, we like to encourage uh, woodlot owners to leave what we call snags. These are either branches or dead trees that have their own uh, natural cavities and they provide homes for a lot of wildlife. Uh, for instance, flying squirrels, which we seem to have a lot of down here and I'm sure you do up there in, in Halliburton too. And the little saw wet owl, uh, a lot of these are passing through Prince Edward County right now. They're about six inches high. They migrate through Prince Edward Point, and we're in the process of banding them right now to see where they finally end up. But they require, um, they require natural cavities to nest in. And here we have an eastern screech owl, same thing. And the great crested flycatcher and our friend the raccoon. Um, these, these animals and birds, they're they are not able to excavate their own holes. They depend on these natural cavities in which to, uh, uh, to raise their young. So how do you bring it to the backyard? This is an aerial shot of Picton, but it can be any uh, uh, suburban area where you will get situations of people living close together with small backyards. Maybe your neighbor doesn't want a brush pile, you know, next to his fence, but there are things that you can do. Now, here's an example of one lady. Uh, her name is Priscilla Wagner. She lives in Belleville. She has a very small property. It's not even half an acre. Um, I dare guess it would be even a quarter of an acre if that. But over the years, she has totally eliminated the grass by digging up and planting areas and planting wildflowers that she has researched that she knows will attract bees and insects. 
and, and hummingbirds and flower or uh, birds that like flowers and butterflies, you name it. And you sit out there in her backyard in the summertime and there's just a steady hum of bees and insects at work just having a grand old time. Let's take another property about two acres in size. Well, I'll confess it's, it's my property. Uh, I live on a place called Big Island, which is just south of Demarest or north of uh, Demarestville, uh, right on the shore of the Bay of Quinte. This is the Big Island Marsh. So this was taken about 2010 because in 2013, Quinte Conservation undertook a $5 million project to excavate channels through this pretty much dead marsh. It's a 2000 acre marsh and created a series of ponds. And there's a pond right out in front of my place. How much luckier can a person get? Eh? And uh, their cha interconnecting channels is just uh, an amazing project. But anyway, on our two acres, if you can imagine this property in 1975, when my wife and I first sold the farm and we retained a couple acres off the corner, um, that this property didn't have a single shrub or tree. I'm not talking about a few shrubs or trees. It had nothing, absolutely nothing. It was wide open. Now, I always like to joke that even the killdeers were a little nervous at, uh, at <laughs> dropping by. Um, it's actually a barnyard, part of a barnyard. Uh, you can see the barn foundation here. This is uh, an historic uh, hop house. We used to grow hops in our area years ago. Uh, this is the house. It's a little modular home. Uh, the garage, which used to be a machinery shed. And we set to work right away planting shrubs and trees that we knew would attract wildlife. And I purposely left this area open because wildlife like open areas as well. So on medium sized properties, I think this property south of Picton was about 16 acres. And this fellow had the best of both worlds. He had a, a, a lawn that he could keep mowed and manicured to keep uh, the um, mosquitoes down. But in the rest of the property, he let it grow up into what was growing there naturally in the first place. And even in, in these properties that you let grow up wild, you've got to uh, manage them to some degree. Now down our way, I'm not sure what it's like in, in Halliburton, we have two species that are very invasive. One is dog strangling vine, otherwise known as swallow wart, and the other is European buckthorn. So he's going through here and just monitoring it to make sure that none of these invasive uh, plants uh, have taken hold. This was obviously taken in the fall because we have some goldenrod growing here and there was all kinds of milkweed behind me when I took this picture. And uh, we have a little bit of uh, butter and eggs. Uh, it's a wildflower that I often call toad flax. So uh, he enjoyed setting this up and he had just tons of wildlife on this property. And it's a matter of what you want. This is the same property over here. This is a different property um, to the north of him, uh, which is uh, adjacent to his property. And they both have kind of a friendly rivalry going on here. Uh, they, neither one of them can understand what the other one is doing, but um, you know, you can imagine how much better success this person has over here with letting it grow up wild and putting up nesting boxes than perhaps what this person does over here by keeping it manicured. Um, sure, he's going to get a few birds and wildlife, but not much, not to the degree that this person is over here. And it's just a matter of what you want. I'm not saying this is wrong. But um, if you like wildlife, then this is certainly the way to go over here on the left. You can add, as I did, a little uh, water garden. This is a relatively small one. And I've got goldfish in there this year. And I've, you know, birds come here all the time because there's running water uh, recirculating through a filter and coming back into the, the pond. And that noise alone uh, attracts wildlife. And then depending on your resources and your time and how creative you are, you can make uh, quite a creation here uh, with wildflowers and, and uh, stonework and so forth. This is down near Wapoops. We recommend that you plant native trees. I'm not saying that uh, nursery ornamentals are wrong, 
but they are designed to look pretty, uh, not necessarily functional. Uh, if you plant native trees, just make sure they're native because we're seeing a lot of um, products, especially in grocery stores, you know, that are labeled green or natural, organic. We don't really know how green they are or natural they are. Those terms are marketing terms, marketing ploys to move product. So the same with uh, shrubs to many, uh, to much extent, to some extent. This is a honey locust. It was sold to me as a native tree. It is native, but not native to here. It's native to Southwestern Ontario. The one we would expect to be native is the black locust. And they're not even native to Ontario. They're native to uh, Southeastern United States, but they're the ones that most people plant. This has done very little to attract wildlife. What it does do is produce these long seed pods, which are about 10 or 11, maybe 12 inches in length, and they fall eventually, and uh, they're just an awful mess. And I've not really seen much wildlife. The reason we chose honey locust is because it's a very fast grower. And you get to a certain age, you, <laughs> you want to see trees that grow fast so we can enjoy them. Why do we insist on native plants? Uh, well, they attract wildlife, obviously. And they adapt readily to local climate. They're attractive and enhance any setting. And they require less maintenance because they've always grown here historically. So they don't really have to adapt. And there's really no secret uh, to planting native plants, native trees. Um, these we are already familiar with. This is silver maple. This is what I planted around the perimeter. Oh, my apologies to my son at uh, age nine, he planted all those silver maples around the border of uh, property that you saw in an earlier photo. Uh, but silver maple grows fast. Uh, they like wet areas and it was quite wet where we planted them. Uh, all of these are excellent trees, uh, depending on the type of soil conditions you have, whether it's droughty or whether it's a wet area and all of them are native trees. Shrubs, same thing. Uh, here we have staghorn sumac, not to be confused with poison sumac, which I don't think occurs in your area. It certainly doesn't occur down in our area. Uh, I think it grows only around the Niagara area. And I think there's a little, well, there is a little pocket up in Frontenac Park because I came across it one day. I was aware of its existence. This species of sumac, staghorn sumac, which you're probably already very familiar with, uh, is quite edible. Uh, birds love the seeds, and if they don't happen to take it, you can eat it yourself. You can make a delicious uh, sumac jelly, which my wife did for years. Uh, she made some back in 2004, and I'm still, I'm still eating it. It's in perfect shape. There's nothing wrong with it at all. You can make what uh, people call a delicious sumac lemonade. Well, that's debatable. I find it quite disgusting, really, but uh, if you put enough sugar with it, it's quite drinkable. But I like it as a, 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 as a sumac jelly. And all of these are very good. Red osier dogwood for wet areas. If you have a dry area, gray dogwood grow, will grow quite well. It's a little more tolerant of uh, dry areas. Service berry is excellent. I love service berry. It, it draws a lot of bird, uh, birds in, in particular. Nanny berry, choke cherry, winterberry. Be a little cautious with high bush cranberry. It's always promoted as a native shrub, and it is a native shrub, but don't plant acres of it because uh, birds will quite often leave it until the very end. They're not that um, fond of it, apparently, despite the looks of it. Now, down our way, and I'm not sure what it's like in Halliburton, I never really noticed, but down here we have what is known as red cedar red juniper and it's a weed tree you don't till a field for even a year and these will spring up like little weeds uh, so don't overlook the obvious uh, hop a fence I'm sure the landowner won't mind you taking a red cedar or two and plant it and if it dies you haven't lost any money you know it's uh, you just plant another but uh, they produce these fruiting berries little blue berries and these are eagerly consumed by a number of visiting birds, such as gross beaks and uh, cedar waxwings, uh, yellow rump warblers. They love these. 
So there we have the food element attracting wildlife to your backyard. Flowering crab, perhaps on the gray side, if you are looking for a purely uh, native tree, it's a cultivar of the, of the crab apple, but it produces these little miniature apples which hang on the tree all through the winter and gross beaks will come and feast on those. So attracting butterflies and hummingbirds. Uh, again, we have a variety of uh, choices. Cardinal flower is, is uh, really good for attracting hummingbirds. Um, it grows all over the place and you can buy all of these at a, a native uh, plant store. I wouldn't go out and dig them. I wouldn't do that with any of the plants except perhaps red cedar. Uh, but all of these are uh, native plants that grow in our area. New England asters are good. They're coming in the bloom right now. Uh, the wild columbine in season, uh, wild bergamot, evening primrose, even turtle head. First time I ever saw turtle head was when I did a kayak trip on the Rideau Canal from Kingston to Ottawa. First time I ever saw or knew about turtle head, but it's a very popular choice. Attracting monarchs. You've often heard that. Uh, Monarch butterflies are attracted by common milkweed, and they are indeed. Uh, but the two favorite milkweeds, if you can plant them and get them growing, is butterfly milkweed uh, for monarch butterflies. And that's this one up here. Uh, they like the drier upland areas. Swamp milkweed prefers um, wetter areas along the edges of uh, ponds, borders of, of uh, wetlands. Very common down our way. Uh, butterfly milkweed, not so much, but butterfly milkweed can be uh, can certainly be ordered and, and, and bought at most uh, native plant outlets. Attracting mason bees. This is something new I've added into my uh, presentation. They belong to a very large group of what we call solitary bees, not to be confused with honey bees and bumblebees, which are social bees and live in hives. Solitary describes uh, any bee species, and there are about 400 different species, uh, where a lone female builds and provisions her own nest all by herself. Uh, so these are commercially made uh, mason bee houses, and you'll see there are different sized holes here to appeal to different sized uh, mason bees. And a female will enter one of these holes, she'll lay her egg, uh, she'll put in some food, which is usually uh, a pollen, and uh, then she'll seal it. As you can see here, depending on the species, this is almost like a masonry cement. And these are little stickers that I put on over top in case chickadees might come along and try to excavate out the, the larva that's developing inside. I just have to remember to take that off in the spring. Um, here's another design here. Uh, so they're, they're very useful in uh, attracting mason bees. And the one thing about mason bees uh, is that they're an ideal backyard neighbor because they don't sting. Uh, only the female stings, and that's only if you pick it up and you squeeze it. So, you know, how many people are going to do that? So uh, once the cell is sealed with food and, and the egg within, the mother bee does not return uh, for any reason at all to the... Um, um, to the cavity and she just goes on her own way and the um, the, uh, the egg will go through the larval and the pupil stage uh, while consuming the food that was lovingly left there by the uh, the mother bee and depending on the species that material can be masonry material as we see here or in the case of grass carrying wasps it will be grass fragments and i've had them nest here too um there are leaf cutters and sand loving wasps and they're all kinds of solitary bees and they're very important pollinators. And the decline in poll pollinators can be attributed to, the, uh, to a variety of things like pesticides and diseases and habitat destruction and air pollution and climate change and uh, you know, a whole wealth of things and competition of course between native and introduced or invasive species. And they're easy to build. They're not particular uh, about what they look like. Uh, this is an insect hotel. Um, down our way, we have a lot of limestone. So it's very easy choice to build something out of limestone slabs and just outfit it with all kinds of rubble, split wood, pieces of bark, 
uh, branches and, and uh, all that sort of thing. And you will definitely get mason bees coming, provided that uh, the front area is facing the sun and it's not being blocked by other vegetation. So some other ideas. Here's a butterfly house. Now butterflies don't nest in here. They just use it as a shelter when they're stormy or cold weather, they may go in there and then they'll come back out when the weather improves. Uh, butterfly feeders. I have one like this and you can see a butterfly here uh, feeding on the um, nectar soaked wick that uh, there are several of them around here and a little places where you can put uh, fruit. In this case, uh, there are some bananas growing there or uh, being placed there. Don't overlook bat houses. We have, well, down here anyway, we have between six and eight species of bats, uh, very important uh, animals to attract. Um, uh, I think probably the only bats that would use something like this are the little brown bats and the big brown bats and perhaps the eastern pipistrel which is also called the tricolored bat. I'm not sure about that one, but they're, they're facing some problems. Um, and um, uh, they're declining in numbers, especially the little brown bat that's uh, been hit hard by uh, white nose syndrome, which is a fungal disease. Uh, wind turbines where they occur are also uh, having a detrimental effect on them, not from the blades necessarily, but when the bats enter uh, the area around the base of the, the turbine, it's creating, um, it's creating a, a difference in, in uh, air pressure and basically their lungs hemorrhage and they die. It's called barrel trauma. So, you know, we need to do everything we can in our backyard to attract wildlife in that manner. Nesting boxes for birds. You don't have to worry a whole lot about the exact size. You don't have to go on the internet and says, well, for a house rent, it has to be this size and that size. Build what I call a common garden variety nesting box that uh, is built primarily for bluebirds. And you may get bluebirds. Uh, you'll likely get uh, tree swallows. A few things to uh, not forget, uh, some um, ventilation up here, uh, an easy clean out. And I prefer this as opposed to uh, the lid opening for clean out or the, God forbid, the, the, the floor. Uh, just put a button here, have this swing up on, um, on two nails, which can form the, the hinge, and uh, it's easy to clean out. Uh, so these, these are very easy to build. And like I say, wildlife isn't particular. They don't have, if the corners don't match, don't worry about it. Uh, bird feeding, just a little bit on bird feeding. Uh, a couple things. Bird feeding is very popular. It's one of the, um, the most popular hobbies in the entire world uh, next to gardening. Um, you don't have to worry about the naysayers who say that bird feeding is interrupting migratory habits. It is not. Uh, most of the birds that come to your bird feeder are permanent residents. They're here. Uh, they treat your feeder as nothing more than another stop in many that they make during the course of the day. You may have noticed yourself at your bird feeders that uh, the birds may be uh, very high in number at a certain time of the day, and then all of a sudden everything will be deserted. That's because they all travel in little bands of, you know, comprising several species, and they're out in, you know, hunting for food as they normally would naturally. So don't think that you're the only source of food. You're not. I know that's disappointing to some, but <laughs> you're not. Um, if you're starting out, there's a, just an absolute plethora of bird feeders. Um, there are some that are designed for specific species in mind, um, but overall the choice is yours as to what uh, you want to have up in your backyard. The more you pay, the better the quality. This one perhaps is around $120. It's built by Dro Yankees uh, and it's guaranteed for a lifetime. So if anything happens, it's replaced or the part is replaced. Squirrel proof feeders. Yes, there are squirrel proof feeders. People claim there aren't. But if you invest $200 into a Dro Yankee flipper, it will be squirrel proof. You get about $100 uh, 
worth of enjoyment from um, the feed that you put into it. And you get $100 worth of entertainment when a squirrel lands on this perch, which as soon as it does, it's act it activates a motor, a battery run motor, which twirls this thing very, very quickly. And there's some interesting videos on, on the internet showing uh, a squirrel hanging on for dear life and, this, and, and hanging on for like five or 10 minutes before it's finally uh, flung off. Very entertaining. <laughs> Um, brome squirrel proof feeders. I love brome. I'm a big promoter of brome feeders. These are all squirrel proof feeders and they are adjustable so that if you don't want say blue jays or grackles, you can adjust the tension uh, to accommodate only the smaller birds that you do want. Uh, peanut feeder, I have one of these and I have one of their general purpose feeders. Again, you're looking at over a hundred dollars, but you're looking at an investment that is guaranteed for a lifetime. Now, down our way, I don't know what you have up in the Halliburton area in the way of a specialized bird feed store, but down our way in Brighton, we have the Birdhouse Nature Store, which was founded many years ago by the late Connie Crow. And she has since passed away. It is now being operated by Bobby Wright in Brighton. And um, the one thing that Connie did uh, uh, develop was a proper mixed bird feed. This feed on the right is what you would get if you went to a, a, a big box store. And I always tell people, if you're hunting around for the cheapest feed that you can find, you're, you might better give up bird feeding because your heart's not really in it. Uh, you need to spend the extra to get what they actually sell under the name, the right stuff. Um, you know, as, as, uh, as frequent a visitor and as good a customer as I am at the birdhouse, they don't even share the recipe with me. <laughs> it's almost like a Kentucky Fried recipe. Uh, it's a secret recipe. I do know what's in it, but not and uh, you know what amounts. So there are peanuts. There are diff two different kinds of uh, sunflower seed. There's Niger seed, uh, finch seed. Uh, there's a little bit of everything. Um, safflower seed is in there, and when I put that in my feeder, every single seed is consumed. That's how good it is. Providing water for birds in the winter time, very important. Uh, birds need water in the winter just as much as they do in the summer. Uh, they're called heated bird bath. They're not really heaters, they are de-icers, which means they keep the water barely above freezing so that you can enjoy uh, bird activity at your feeder all through the winter. Um, and they know when to bathe and when it's too cold not to. And they don't really bathe that much, but they do use it as a water source for drinking. This is mine here. Uh, the heating unit is contained right in the basin. Don't overlook summer feeding. Now that we know that uh, we feed birds not because we feel that they need it, we feed birds because we want to have them around our backyard. And there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. So continue through the summer and that will attract birds into your backyard. You'll get a different clientele. Here we have some goldfinches coming to a Niger feeder. Um, I have had uh, catbirds, brown thrashers come to my feeder. It's always interesting to see what chooses to uh, take advantage of your feeder during the summer months. Of course, hummingbirds are legendary. Uh, they've been coming to feeders for years. And of course, you will get things passing through during migration in the spring, such as indigo buntings and rose-breasted grosbeaks. Some of them may remain to nest, others will continue on. Here we have a Baltimore Oriole eating oranges. I just want to talk for a minute on nuisance animals. What do you do when you get too much of a good thing? And live trapping has always been considered the uh, humane way of dealing with a problem. It isn't. It's probably one of the uh, cruelest ways of dealing with a problem that uh, you can, you can uh, employ. Um, you don't control wildlife by physical removal. Uh, 
live trapping is an exercise in futility at best, as wildlife is never sedentary. It's always moving around and seeking out vacant real estate, and it isn't long before another so-called nuisance animal has, um, has arrived to, to take the place. And you see people all the time live trapping uh, beavers. You know, oh, we've solved the beaver problem. And in less than a month, another beaver has moved in. That's what wildlife does. It's very mobile. It's, it, it moves and, and occupies the uh, unoccupied space. Just a few points. Live trapping, like I say, opens the space for another of the same species to move in. And it won't be long before that happens. Now, the live trap animal must now seek out a new food source. It doesn't know where the food is. It's in a new territory. So you've got that to consider. Live trapping squirrels and chipmunks may work as they are very mobile and cover large territories. I do so myself from time to time when the population gets a little high um, because desperation takes over. When you have your wiring all chewed and you have a, a squirrel get into your travel tra trailer like it did mine one time and just make a mess of everything and they get into your attic, uh, they can do irreparable harm. So it does become necessary to control their numbers. And I think they do adjust a little better because they're very mobile. They do move around a lot. And, uh, you know, from my own observations, I think they do all okay. But not so with a large lumbering animal like a raccoon or even skunks or, or groundhogs because um, they are now being introduced uh, to an area that's already occupied by uh, a pair of that species. And it's a, it's a, it's a fight to the finish. Uh, you might just as well, and I hate to tell you this, but if you have a nuisance raccoon, rather than live trap it and release it somewhere else, you might just as well shoot it because it's, uh, it, it's, it's really the only way. It's really the most humane way. Unless you work within nature and uh, work through the the four components of wildlife habitat and eliminate what it is that's attracting them. And that can be leaving out garbage. That can be uh, having an area where they can raise their young. Just search and see what you've got out there that may be attracting raccoons. You, you take away the source of uh, attraction and you will remove the raccoon. They'll go somewhere else. That's my suggestion anyway. Uh, also, live trapping of done in the wrong season may leave offspring behind uh, to starve. And this is true of squirrels. I only trap squirrels at certain times of the year when I do so at all. Uh, I'm very careful to understand when their, uh, when their breeding period is so that I'm not risking leaving any, any young ones behind. And let's face it. It's just irresponsible behaviors. You are just turning your problem over to some other poor landowner who may already be suffering the same problems as you are. So try and work within wildlife if you can and uh, inside their or within their requirements. So what have we done on our property since uh, 1975? What have we attracted? Well, brown thrashers have nested, as have gray catbirds. Um, we also get uh, stopovers by white-throated sparrows and white-crowned sparrows. White-throated sparrows do nest here as they do in the Halliburton area, I'm sure, as they are typically a northern bird. But not so the white-crowned sparrow. They nest well out of Ontario in the Hudson Bay lowlands. So you're only going to see them as a migrant. But your property, if it has the right components, will attract them during the migration. Uh, we've had yellow warblers nest and just a, a, a wide variety of warblers drop by. This is the magnolia warbler. In our area, uh, they're, they're only, they only pass through. Uh, they're on their, ways to, on their way to nesting areas further north. And that could be Halliburton. I'd have to read up on each individual one to know for sure. Uh, Black-throated green warblers, uh, they nest here locally. So you'll see all these on your property. And it's a real treat to know that what you are doing has attracted this. So what is my yard list? Well, for many people, a yard list includes all the species that they may have heard or seen while standing in their own backyard. I'm too much of a purist to do that. The birds that come to my backyard have to actually touch terra firma, or at the very least, 
be flying over. And I have cheated. I saw a bald eagle coming my way one time. And uh, I, oh God, I really wanted to get that thing on my yard list. So I hollered and I screamed at it and clapped my hands. And eventually the bald eagle did look down and see what all the noise was about. He got entered onto the yard list because he had an interest in my backyard. I know it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a bit on the edge. Of those 132 bird species, I've had 24 species to nest or nested. And that's incredible considering that we barely had killdeers when we started out. I've had 19 mammal species, 14 herptiles, which includes uh, uh, amphibians and reptiles. For four years, I guess it was, I've had a pair of ospreys nesting. Uh, they nested on top of my 60 foot self supporting tower that I used to use uh, to pull in the television stations, which I no longer use. Heck, I don't even have television anymore. I just use YouTube. Uh, but the Ospreys, they nested on top of the antenna and they did so uh, for four years. And this year, uh, the weight got too heavy and the whole thing collapsed. Uh, here's a weasel. We've had weasels. Now, you look at this picture, you see the weasel has what appears to be a deer mouse. And this is where it all begins to come together, where you say, okay, what I'm doing is, is having an effect. We've got some biodiversity happening here, where one animal is living off another. Um, getting back to brush piles, now that we have trees, I have branches that fall down and have to be gathered up, and I always put them in a big pile. And in the fall of the year, I put them through my uh, wood chipper. This is an MTD wood chipper, which is, I think, eight horsepower. And that brush pile looks like this when I'm all finished with it. And this is a very fine mulch that can be put around your flower beds. Here we are trying to keep everything responsibly on our own property without putting anything out at the curbside or taking it to the landfill site. It's uh, really, uh, it's a case of caring for your little piece of heaven responsibly by composting. Here we have a Toro um, um, lawnmower with a, a mulching uh, capabilities. And I mulch all my leaves, no leaves, very few leaves get burned. Uh, mostly they get mulched if I can mulch them at all. Now I wanna talk for just a few minutes on what I call the ribbon of life and the importance of um, shorelines what we call the living edge or the ribbon of life. And this is where land, water, and air meet. It is a very critical part of the landscape if you're lucky enough to be living on the shore of a lake. <clears throat> Excuse me, I need to have a drink of water. Um, <clears throat> it contributes significantly to the overall health of our entire water system. That meeting of air, water, and land fosters a diversity of life and thus an intricate food web. Each species is what you might call a thread in that web, and each thread relies on all others for survival. And on us humans to maintain a clean natural environment. As we alter this landscape, if we choose to do so, uh, threads begin to snap and the repercussions resonate throughout the entire web. So things start to break down. Native vegetation such as cattails, lily pads and trembling aspens and so forth provide birthplaces, food and shelter for an amazing 90% 90% of all aquatic and terrestrial lake and river life. So we need to protect these critically important areas or improve them when we can. Now here is a, it's what I call the manicure mania. We see a lot of this in Prince Edward County. We are learning, we are managing to convince people that this is the wrong thing to do. They mow their lawns to the edge of the water because they want to have a clear view. If you can imagine if they fertilize their lawn or if they use pesticides, how much of that during a rainfall is running into the very body of water that they want to, um, you know, they want to enjoy. It's not the way to go. 
if you mow your grass to the water's edge, what you will have, at least in Prince Edward County anyway, you're going to have Canada geese because they consider your uh, nicely mowed lawn to the water's edge as a grassed runway. There's nothing preventing them from coming up uh, and, and browsing on your grass. Now, here's an idea. Leave a little bit of natural vegetation along the shoreline. It doesn't have to be messy. Now, this particular resident south of Belleville, all he did was just stop mowing down to, the, down to within about three feet of the water's edge and just let the native plants grow up. It doesn't grow up high, so it's not impeding his view at all of the, uh, of the Bay of Quinty in this particular case. Um, and as a result, he has not had Canada geese because Canada geese tend to be very shy about going through vegetation. They're very suspicious of it, um, very suspicious of anything overhanging them. A lot of people um, tie up balloons and, and do a variety of tactics to prevent them from uh, coming up on the, onto the lawn. And his idea has worked and it required no money, no planting, he just used what was there. But his neighbor who does stubbornly mow the grass to the water's edge has Canada geese all the time. This is nothing to stop. And it can be done very attractively, you know, with uh, native shrubs and flowers and uh, it doesn't have to look messy at all. Um, I will take time to read through all this, but you can see all the different points I'm trying to make here through this, uh, uh, through this illustration. Uh, we have several things um, that are favorable. We have uh, a person composting kitchen scraps for soil fertility, well-dressed shoreline full of native plants. Um, it's less work and more relaxing time. Uh, it, it just makes good wildlife habitat. However, we are still seeing this sort of thing where we have the removal of natural vegetation, uh, manicured lawns to the water's edge, uh, a very hardened shoreline uh, eliminates that natural filter and degrades the water quality. Uh, so here are the two comparisons. Where would you like to live? You know, I would prefer here. It, it even looks cool uh, the way it is here. It's very hot. I'm sure it is. So some options for shorelines. What do we plant? Well, you want, you want trees that are, um, I'm just checking my time here. <laughs> I'm running over time. Sorry about that. Uh, you want trees that are will adapt to a watery environment, uh, and here's a list here on the left of all those trees that will work well in moist conditions. Likewise, with shrubs and ground covers, fragrant sumac, perhaps not the best choice for a shoreline. Uh, higher up, it works well. It likes drier areas. Virginia creeper, wintergreen, bittersweet, bearberry, uh, different types of water wildflowers that you can choose. I did a little investigation uh, on the internet, came up with some sites, uh, the Halliburton County Master Gardeners, which you are probably already familiar with. Uh, they have a website, Gardening in Halliburton County. And if you go into that website, just type it in uh, and click on the Buy Local page. It's just an amazing uh, source of information. There are lots of agencies out there who can help you both with guidance and in some cases, financial help. There are Watersheds Canada is a very important one. Your local conservation authority, and I don't believe you have a conservation authority in the Halliburton area. Uh, part of it might touch on it from uh, Crow Valley, but any conservation authority will help you with at least making some suggestions. And Quinney Conservation down our way might be able to help or advise through their natural shorelines program, which includes the Natural Edge Shoreline Planting Program. There's just a wealth of information out there. So, concluding, enjoy your wildlife that you have worked so hard to attract and pat yourself on the back if you get all these species. So once again, it's food, water, shelter, and space. It, uh, that's how you get your biodiversity uh, and you will be able to enjoy your property. And I always like to leave with um, some sort of conservation message. So property stewardship is protecting and preserving the land you love uh, and is caring for your property for you, your children, and a healthy environment. So thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. I hope you're all still there. It's a long presentation. 
And I will leave this up just for a moment or two. So if you want to contact me, I do have um, PDFs of a lot of the information on native shrubs and plants and wildflowers that I would be happy to uh, email you if you just contact me at tspreg at explorenet.net. Um, and I just realized I got explorenet spelled wrong. Explorenet without the E. You can go into my website. Uh, there is, uh, where is, oh, there it is. There's the contact. You hit the contact, you know it'll come up with uh, a place where you can leave a message. So that said, I will stop the share. And again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Terry. That was a really great presentation. I really lo loved all the pictures of the birds and the wildlife. You made it, made it really interesting to watch. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank um, you. Uh, I, at this point, I'm not sure if Simon Payne is still with us, but if he is, um, I would, I'm here. would like to Simon to, hi Simon. So uh, Simon has a, a really hi, exciting project that he started in, uh, in Halliburton and I'd like him to say a few words about that. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, th thanks, Susan, and thanks, Terry, for a fascinating um, and helpful presentation. Um, yeah, just briefly, I, I'm a co-owner of Lucas House in um, Halliburton Village. Uh, and if you don't know it, it's the yellow brick um, century home next to the post office um, on the corner there. And uh, we're busy renovating it at the moment. And what we always wanted to do was create a um, native plant garden. Uh, when we bought it, it was all Lord, and uh, we wanted to bring some biodiversity to this part of the part of the village. Um, as with all well laid plans, the building work meant we couldn't do it this year because they're going to bring some big trucks onto the lawn. So instead, it came to May and the dandelions were blooming, and I thought, oh well, it's no more May. I'll just let the grass grow, um, and so I let the grass grow, and then um, May turned into um june can you still hear me my internet's bad yep you're okay. fine may turned into june turned into july and the grass kept growing and i just wanted to share a couple of experiences with you um one was my own psychological experience in that um you know i believe in everything that's been talked about today but there's many times i would walk past there and think oh it looks so untidy and messy because we, you know, the, we're used to lawns are supposed to be mowed and neat and, you know, grass. And this is in a semi-urban kind of area. And I had to check myself and think, you know, hang on a minute. Um, this is not what you're doing. Um, there's a different way of looking at beauty. And then I would look closely at the lawn and find all the amazing species of plants that were blooming for perhaps the first time in decades. Because they've always had their heads chopped off um, until now. Um, and um, so I did check myself and think, you know, this is what I really want to do. But also there are neighbours and, and townsfolk also around. So um, Pam, who manages the gallery in our building, said, put a couple of signs up, you know, that um, explain what you're doing and encourage people to come in and, um, and ask about it. So we did. And a bit later, I trimmed the edges of the lawn. Um, so it looks like it's not neglected it looks like it's actually well, deliberately <laughs> neglected in a way um and we have many people coming in people what i found is people are skeptical um because they're used to lawns being neat and they think what are you doing but once i explained what we were doing we had an information sheet once i explained what we we're doing people bought into it and they're in some ways very grateful that we were doing it and we're very supportive and it just made me think this is kind of changing the culture a little bit and it's an education piece and so you know kind of the kind of the purpose of this building here and particularly with the, the garden around it is to be a demonstration of what you could do you don't have to cut the grass all the time you can have a different types of plants that terry was talking about and so in the future like I say, we'll be planting more native plants, doing some more exciting things. Um, but right now, 
yesterday I noticed a beautiful aster blooming, blue, that beautiful blue color that's blooming right now. And I thought, wow, isn't that great? So I think that's all I wanted to share, Susan, whether, unless you had any questions for me. That's wonderful. I, I just think it's a great idea. I hope it uh, goes viral. <laughs> well, I, I think it's a great idea too. And it's a, it's a work in progress. I find that you will make some mistakes along the way that you know, well, this isn't working. And uh, actually I tried to naturalize my front lawn during the high water of, when was it, 2017? We actually had water on the lawn. I couldn't mow it, uh, but it was a disaster. <laughs> So you do have to manage it somewhat. You just can't let everything grow. You have to do some management to it. So I wish you the best of success. It sounds like a great idea. Thanks. So Thanks, there, there were a couple of questions that I, um, I thought maybe I'd address. Um, <clears throat> so someone asked, uh, what was the preferred orientation for mason bee nests? Uh, mine are facing south. That seems to be very uh, popular. Not too terribly high. Um, I would say no more than seven or eight feet. They keep it fairly low. Uh, that's about all I can offer. Uh, it depends on what you're, you're, you're putting. If you're building that huge um, structure, that I made reference to with uh, limestone rocks or uh, uh, yeah, face it south so that it gets uh, the sunlight, which they like, and just make sure that uh, you don't have any shrubs or trees in front to uh, prevent them from entering. So my, my husband put up a mason bee um, nest and was on a, um, some siding and we were concerned that maybe uh, in the hot afternoon sun, it might actually cook the bees. <laughs> it might get a little warm, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, um, home, hard, home Hardware sold one, and it was endorsed by uh, gardening expert Mark Cullen. And, mm -hmm. of course, that added about $20. To, so I ended up paying about $80, and it was a wooden structure. And the first year... Uh, the woodpeckers came along and just riddled it to pieces. So you do have to protect it somewhat with maybe netting, uh, like chicken wire, to prevent mm -hmm. that from happening. Just, you know, if you should go that route. Okay. Um, so up in Halliburton, we do have bears. And the number one reason for Ministry of Natural Resources, people getting called out on bear complaints is because of feeding the birds. Yeah, I never thought of that. That uh, we we get the occasional straggler down our way, but they're not by no means common. So yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it, you have to change your tactics considerably. Either stop feeding altogether, or, or create a way that bears cannot access. And I'm just not quite sure what that would entail. Uh, yeah, yeah, think... you, have to, you have to kind of go with what you know what your problems might be. We most most people don't really want to attract bears in the first no, place. Of course not. No, not. <laughs> not good for neighbor relations. No. <laughs> so so uh, I, I personally think stopping feeding birds in the summertime is probably the best way to maintain good neighbor relations. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, there was a question about monarch butterflies and um, this person has uh, had a, a whole lot of, of milkweed in their yard, but this year they said they didn't see any monarchs. And I'm wondering, is that because of a decline in the monarch population or is, is there some other reason? It could be due to the decline. Uh, I had quite a patch of milkweeds myself, common milkweeds, and, and they never utilized them this year at all. So I, I don't know what the reason is, you know, who knows? It could be a number of reasons. Uh, they may have seen, you know, better habitat elsewhere. We decided to go there. You know, <laughs> we can only speculate. Okay. Um, so cleaning bird feeders. I, I've read that um, if you don't clean your bird feeders properly, frequently, that you can um, 
spread bird diseases. This particularly, there's something that affects their eyes, and another one, their throats. Yeah, yeah that's uh, conjunctivitis, and that's mm -hmm. mainly among the finch species, such as house finches and uh, goldfinches. It uh, it's kind of cyclic; it comes and goes. Uh, I didn't notice any this year at all. But yeah, it's very important uh, because the, uh, the the disease, the fungus, feeds on dirty feeders, uh, where you have a lot of um, where you have a lot of uh, uh, mold build up, and so it's very important. I clean I clean one feeder. I have about thirty feeders up, so uh, just to <laughs> use that to justify uh, what I'm about to say, but I clean one bird feeder every week. And that's why I like the, the uh, higher end feeders because they come apart easily. They clean easily. Most of them you can put in a dishwasher. Uh, I don't have a dishwasher, but um, it, it just clean them on a regular basis. And then, you know, maybe the following week, clean another one and keep the platform area clean. And uh, you shouldn't have any problems at all. Okay. Um, and another question is what to do with leaves. And Eric and I have a <laughs> little, have a little lot. <laughs> but what to do with leaves. And I know you mentioned um, that you mulch your leaves, but yeah. I understand that leaf debris um, is important for overwintering of uh, beneficial insect species. It's, and if you mulch the leaves, aren't you destroying those insects? You are. It depends on where you, um, let's put it this way. If you can find an area on your property that you can leave the leaves uh, to do that job, um, that, that's preferable, I suppose. But if you have an area that uh, you would normally, in the past, have raked the leaves, mulch them with a, with a mulching mower, for sure. And that'll drive all those nutrients into the soil. But yeah, I think it's important to leave an area that, uh, you know, that, that, that has the, a natural cover of leaves. Okay. It depends on the size of the property, you know. Yes. Okay, well, I, that's, I think, about all the questions. Is there anybody who wants to um, bring my attention to any other, any other questions? Um, if not, then I'd like to thank Terry very much for his interesting presentation. It was wonderful, all the pictures that you showed, was, and it was very relaxing. <laughs> oh, thank you. It was my pleasure. It's one of my favorite presentations. Oh, we really, really appreciate it, and especially um, on such short notice. So, and I'd also like to thank Simon for his contribution to our um, presentation, a very interesting project, and I hope it, hope it takes off. So thank you everyone for coming. And I, um, I would just like to point out that um, working on a presentation for October, hopefully we're going to learn a little bit more about the seven youth that are suing the Ford government. Uh, it's called Mather et al. And uh, over there, um, uh, withdrawing a lot of climate action that the wind government had put in place. So hopefully we can bring that together if we can get in contact with these uh, seven youth and, and eco justice who, who was um, involved in uh, supporting this um, lawsuit going forward. So anyway, thanks again, everyone. And uh, uh, I wish you a good night and uh, hopefully we'll see you in October. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm due for a trip to Halliburton very soon. We would <laughs> welcome you. Get in touch. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Good night, everyone.